little bit about on Thursday. I went through it carefully to figure out the different perspectives, and there's a couple of perspectives that work that uh, it's a little more complicated than I originally realized. So let's take a look at it. If we're, if we're winching up the entire cable, it's simple. We just integrate 0 to 20, and it's no big deal. And so the question was, uh, should we integrate 0 to 10 or 10 to 20? And if we integrate 0 to 10, we got the right answer. If we integrate it from 10 to 20, we didn't get the right answer. We only um, got, uh, I forget how many joules, but less joules. And the, the, when we go from 10 to 20, the answer is really as if we just had a cable that was 10 meters long that was getting wrapped up, getting, getting uh, winched up. So here is what we have to do. There are two perspectives on the cable being winched up. This is the final perspective, right? There's going to be 10 meters of cable hanging. So when we, if we integrated just 10 to 20, we haven't taken into consideration the fact that the lower 10 is also getting lifted. And so the, there's a couple of ways that you can think about that lower 10. You can think about the cable being 20 units, 20 meters long, where we break the 20 meters into 10 that's being hoisted up, and the other 10 you can imagine as just a block that's being lifted, at, that's hanging at the bottom of the cable. And I believe our block, our, our believe our cable was uh, 50 meters. Or excuse me. 50 kilograms, so this is 20, a 25 kilogram block. So we can do this this way, where we integrate 10 to 20. That's representing the top 10 meters of cable being lifted. But then we have to also add on the fact that there's a block that's just being lifted. And when a block is being lifted, it's just ADD, acceleration, density, distance. So if we're just lifting a block, if you have a block in your hand, ADD is how much work is done. Acceleration times density times distance. So this is one way that we will get the right answer. Integrate 10 to 20 because those cable, those, uh, the section of rope or cable from 10 to 20 is being lifted, 20 minus y. But you also have to add on the block that's at the bottom of it. Now the other perspective is that here's the original cable. You could imagine that when you look at the final cable position, you could imagine just the lower section from 0 to 10 being transitioned to the top. If there was something like liquid or something, you could imagine pulling it from the bottom. But with a cable, it's not. you can't quite imagine it that way. But you could conceptualize these 10 being lifted up to the top and winched up. So if you do integrate 0 to 10, you will end up with the same answer because you end up in the same final position where there's 10 meters of cable hanging off the end. So either one of those ways will work. This probably makes the most sense intuitively because you're lifting from the, the cable from 10 to 20. And if you plug those numbers in here, you can see that your distances change from 10 meters away to 0 meters away. So that's very intuitive. But you have to take into consideration that lo the lower 10 is just hanging on, and it takes work to lift those lower 10 also. So you have to add on ADD for just the lifting of a block. So either of those will work and give us the 3675 joules. Either perspective works. Um, any questions on those two perspectives? All right, so look at those. Make sure you end up with the same 3675 that we talked about. We did this one in class last time, but <coughs> check that you also get the same answer with that. And then let's go to our pressure. So let's start one of these problems. The author is very clever with his wording, the crux of any damn problem. Uh, so the idea here is that 
we're, we have a dam wall, and we want to know the total force that's on that wall. And uh, when we think about pressure, pressure is force per unit area. Pressure is force per unit area. And we all know the deeper you go in the water, the more pressure you feel. So pressure is a linear function of depth. The deeper you go, the more pressure you feel. Okay. And so at any horizontal level beneath the water, you feel constant pressure. So there's constant pressure along a horizontal layer of water, or in this case, we're thinking about a strip of water that's pressing against this, this wall. And it's constant pressure along any horizontal line. So when we figure out the total force on this wall, we are going to have to integrate because the pressure is variable depending on the depth. Like we mentioned last time, the fascinate, one of the fascinating things about water pressure against the wall is that it does not depend on how much volume there is behind the wall. You can have a very thin film of water, or you can have a mile deep of water, and the pressure is the same. The force is the same. So it doesn't matter. Um, so you'd have to have just as big a dam if you're behind the dam, there was just a few feet of water, which is completely unintuitive for most of us. OK. So hopefully you watch the two hydrostatic pressure videos. Watch those too if you haven't, hydrostatic force. Watch those too if you haven't watched those yet. Those are very, in, they help to build your intuition for water pressure. Okay, so here's what we have to do. Now, we've been doing problems where we were finding work, and work was ADD volume. Force is going to be ADD area. And that makes sense because force times distance would give us work. Okay, so force times distance is work. And so here we are going from work back down to force, so we're taking away one dimension. We're going from volume to area. So here, so pressure is the ADD. That's acceleration times density times depth. That's pressure. ADD will give us pressure. And Let's go ahead and try to calculate then, uh, in an example, what the force on this wall will be. Now, intuitively, the idea is that we are going to get the force along this little strip. We're going to create an infinite number of little strips and add up everything to get the total force. That'll be our kind of plan. So a couple of things in terms of units. Pressure is force per unit area. Force, units of newtons. Area, meters squared. So pressure, newtons per meter squared. So we always want to think about our units as lining up. If you get your units to line up, most likely you've put everything in the right place. I did hit start on that. Okay. Uh, also, units of pressure, you could use Pascals. Doesn't matter. Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Our intuition for a Newton, we think of mass times acceleration. So if you write it that way, mass is a kilogram. Acceleration is meter per second squared. So a Newton, kilogram meter per second squared. Density is grams per cubic centimeter or kilograms per uh, cubic, uh, cubic meter. All right. so. The idea, again, is just to ream on something. We're going to be focusing on strips here. Now, before we do our first example, we need to know the width of that strip. If we're finding horizontal distances, we need a change in x's. So we would need to know the equation of this line and then solve for x so that we could calculate this distance right here. So if we know the equation of this line, and solve it for x, x will represent this distance, and then the width of our strip would be twice x. So if we have the y-axis bisecting our wall, then x is going to represent half the length of that 
strip, half the width. So let's go ahead and try one. So ADD area, the ADD is what we've already been doing, acceleration, density, depth. Acceleration is the G, density is rho, Greek letter P, rho, and then depth is height minus your Y value. And then the area is the width of the strip multiplied by the height of the strip, which is dy. So area in this case is the width multiplied by the height. So it's a tiny little strip of area. Width times height, height being dy. So very similar to our vessels, when we had our cylinders or our uh, cone, conical vessel, whatever, any of those vessels, we thought of a cross-sectional area, which was often a disk, and then we multiplied by dy to get the thickness to get a cross-sectional volume. So cross-sectional area times dy gave cross-sectional volume. Here, we have cross-sectional, this cross-sectional strip, so just a width, and then if we multiply by dy, we get the thickness of this strip. Okay, so that's what this area is representing. This is representing the area of an element, a horizontal element. So we'll start off with a really simple one. We just have a rectangular wall. So this one is as simple as it will get. This is just so simple you would not, and not see it on an exam. So we have, we want to figure out the total force. So we're imagining our, our, our little strip across. And we're going to just do our acronym. So we're going to do ADD times area. This is going to give us force. ADD area will give force. And same as it ever was, the acceleration is 9.8. That's right there, acceleration. And then density, it, we're talking about water. Density for water is 1,000. And then depth. So we think of our horizontal element as the element at a height of y. So the distance below the surface is going to be 10 minus y. So if that element is at y, then the distance below the surface is 10 minus y. That's our d, 10 minus y. And now our area, and that includes the differential. So this is going to be the width, which is simple in this case because it's uniform. The whole way across, it's 40. It doesn't matter where you are, times dy. So this right here is what we mean when we say area. It's the area of that little strip. Pressure is ADD. Well, the 1,000 is always going to be the pressure or the depth of the water. 1,000 right? uh, is always the density of water. Density of water. Kilogram mm -hmm. per cubic meter. Why is it, uh, for 10 minus y, can it just as easily be y minus 10, or? Well, if we're thinking of our coordinate system like so, where, that, where that's the origin, you know, kind of the, the x-axis, then um, we don't want to do y minus 10 because that will give us a negative number. So y is going to be an element that's at a height somewhere between 0 and 10. So perhaps y is 4. Then the distance beneath the surface will be 10 minus 4. So it's going to be 10 minus the y value to get you a positive distance below the surface. And then we have an integral that goes from 0 to 10. So. For most of us, this part is going to be pretty darn simple for most of us. Because it's always 9.8, it's always 1,000, it's always the upper level minus y. So the ADD part is uh, pretty much the easiest part. And that is pretty easy. Because for any time we're dealing with water, we're always using a horizontal element, so we always use a dy. So the only thing that tends to be tricky is that. So finding the width of the element, that's going to be the hard part when we don't have a rectangular wall. 
So everything is constant and it just jumps out to the front. We get our 9800 multiplied by 40. That's all in front. And we integrate. We get 10y minus y squared divided by 2. And that is on the interval 0 to 10. <coughs> so 9800 times 40 times, plugging in the 10, we get 100 minus 50, which is 50. So whatever that is, somebody have a calculator, multiply that out. This will be the total force on the wall. And that's a lot of newtons. So that's the total force. Now, woo. Now, there is another way that you can find the total force on a wall, especially when you have a rectangular wall. You can think about the line where the average pressure is. So you could find, you could, and in this case, it's going to be the midpoint. So the average pressure would be halfway down. And you could do an average pressure type of argument and not do any integration at all. So you could find the average pressure and then uh, multiply by the area of the wall. That would also work, actually. Average pressure times the area. Most of the time, we're going to be dealing with something that's not symmetric in that way, so that's not really going to help us. Uh, but you could think about that if you have a rectangular wall. Take the average pressure times the area of the, of the wall. Question? Just to clarify, yeah. so since it's a water problem and it's linear, we're doing dy. Since it's dy, we then know to do the integration points of the vertical 0 to 10? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So in any of these water ones, let's actually, so here, Let's find the force on this window. It's in a pool that's four meters deep, filled with water. We've got this little viewing window down here. Find the force on the window. So the water is four deep. So that's going to inform our integration limits. Here, we're going to integrate y such that we're going to go across the full length of the window here. So here, we're gonna, we're, if, if we put our coordinate system like this, you can put your coordinate system wherever you want. I usually like to put it so that whatever the object is, it's sitting on the x-axis. Uh, the bottom of the pool, to me, makes the most sense for the coordinate system. Some people might go with the coordinate system, right? You know, so the circle is centered, and then you would have negative y values. Doesn't matter. So here, the height of this window, since it's a circle with radius 1 half, this would be 1. We'd integrate 0 to 1 because we want each, each strip of the window being integrated. So this is a lot harder because the width of this strip depends on the functions that are at the left and right edges of the strip. So we certainly can use symmetry here. Now again, force is pressure times area. Pressure, the way we're, we've been talking about, ADD, acceleration density and depth or distance below the surface. Now, here is the hard part. So, easy part is the ADD. That's the easy part, right there. Everyone agree with that ADD? Acceleration due to gravity. Rho is the density of water, which is the thousand. And when we do our element across here, we have y. So the distance this strip is below the surface is 4 minus y. y measures this distance, and so the upper distance is 4 minus y. So that's the part that we don't have to do a lot of thinking with, nor that. There is the thickness of the strip, dy. The 2 is a symmetry thing because we can measure this distance right there and double it. So that's what that 2 is. 
when we put our coordinate system here and we solve for the equation for this right edge of the circle, that x value is going to give us half this width, so we double it to get the full width. So we need to find the equation of the circle and solve for x. That will give us the equation of the right side, and then we can double it. So equation of a circle. So we have a circle centered at 0, 1 half. That's the center. So we know that our equation will be x minus 0 quantity squared plus y minus 1 half quantity squared equals the radius squared. So 1 fourth, 1 half squared, 1 fourth. So let's Get rid of the zero, and we'll subtract this quantity to the other side, the y term. And when we take the square root, we get plus or minus the positive, we get plus or minus the square root of this expression. The positive corresponds to the right semicircle. The negative corresponds to the left semicircle. So positive is the right half, the right side. And the negative is going to be the left side. So you have two perspectives here. You could say, OK, this x, the positive square root, measures that distance right there from the y-axis over to the right. And we know by symmetry that we're going to double it, so we put the 2 in. The other perspective is to say, OK, I've got the whole width of this strip. I need to do right minus left to get that horizontal distance. Well, if the right is the positive square root, and the left is the negative square root, and you did right minus left, you do positive square root minus minus square root. So you'd get square root plus square root, which is two square root. Everyone follow that? So if you were doing right minus left, you would do the positive square root, that's the right, minus the left, well, the left is minus the square root. And so this turns into root plus root, which is 2 times the square root, which is what we have right there. So the simplest way is just to find the equation of the right side and double it. But the effect is the same. You could go right minus left. doesn't matter. Both will work. So that is our x value. We now know our width is 2. So let's go ahead. So equation of the circle, half the width of the element. So we've got all that stuff. So now we're going to integrate from 0 to 1. ADD, so 9.8 times 1,000, the depth or the distance below the surface is 4 minus y, times the width of our element, which is twice the square root of 1 fourth minus y minus half squared. Can you explain why I do 4 minus y and not 1 minus y? So pressure depends on how far below the surface you are. Because you're imagining this column of water on top. So if you did 1 minus y, then you'd be interpreting this as a window that has only a depth of 1. Right? And we know that the deeper we go, it matters how much water is above your head. That's what causes the pressure that you feel in your ears or on your head. So we've got to go from the surface of the water. So the distance that we're 
talking about is the depth right there. Okay, so let's try to do this integral. We have the the 9,800 that comes out, and we double that. So I'll just write it as 9,800 times 2 for the moment. Maybe we'll have some cancellations, so maybe we don't need to multiply that out. On the inside, we definitely are going to foil that out to see if we can get some fancy u substitution to work. So we're going to have 1 quarter minus the quantity y squared minus. So we have a perfect square trinomial. We're foiling this out. We get y squared. a times b is going to be negative 1 half y. And then we double it. So we get minus y plus 1 fourth. And of course, that simplifies. The one-fourths cancel, we end up with square root of minus y squared minus y. So we have that. Um, doesn't look like u substitution is going to work very well. Plus y, right? Qu oh, plus y, thank you. Thank you, thank you, plus y. Uh, when we take that derivative, we get minus 2y minus 2y plus 1, and that doesn't match 4 minus y. So the u substitution is not going to work very well there. So here's what we're going to do. Um, let's notice that, so let's just note that uh, minus y squared plus y has a derivative of minus 2y plus 1. So that's not helping. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to split this into a pair of integrals, but we need to split it creatively so that we can use u substitution for one of them. So here's what we're going to do. I see that I want a minus 2y in here to match the minus 2y, which is the derivative right there. So I'm going to take this 2, commutative law of multiplication says I can multiply any two factors that I want and not change the equality. So I could do this. I could take this 2 and I could drop it in there and make this 8 minus 2y. Right, so we just combine two factors. We have a bunch of stuff multiplied together. We can multiply any pair that we want together. And I said commutative law. It's actually the associative law. Associative law says we can switch things around, multiply any two pair. OK. Now, I'm trying to target this 1 minus 2y right there. So I'm going to bust this apart. I'm going to make this. 7 plus 1 minus 2y times the square root. I can do that. I can just take an 8 and rewrite it as 1 plus 7. No harm. And now we've got to be clever with our distribution. We are going to think of this as two terms being added together, and the square root is going to distribute to each of them. So the square root is going to distribute to each of those. So we are now going to rewrite this as 9,800 and then integral of 7 times the square root plus 1 minus 2y times the square root. So we can do that. That's no problem. Just distributed the square root to each of those yellow terms, just like foiling, or maybe unfoiling. So 
That one we now know how to integrate with u substitution. That one's going to integrate really easily. This one we have to think about for a minute. That one u sub is going to work for. So let's go ahead and do u sub on this one. We're going to let u equal minus y squared plus y. du will be minus 2y plus 1 times dy. So 9,800 multiplied by a bunch of stuff. This one, I'm going to just start separating these apart, thinking of integrating separately. So we're going to have 7 times the integral from 0 to 1 square root. And I'm actually going to take this inside here and go back to what it was before we did all the multiplication. I'm going to go back to this form of it. Right, that's what it was before. Or maybe I don't even have to do that, but we can at least conceptually think about that's where it came from. So let's let maybe just put that on the back burner for now. Let's just leave it as it is, but we're going to think about this as the right half of a circle of radius 1 half that's centered at 0, 1 half. That's what we're going to think about this as in a moment. Let's pause on that, though. Over here, we've now integrated, or we are now about to integrate, I should say. We're going to integrate, so we have plus u to the 1 half du. Right? Because we're replacing the minus y squared plus y with u, so that's u to the half. And then du is 1 minus 2y times dy. That's du. And then we can either use the same limits in the end, or we can convert to u limits. It's pretty easy to convert here, so let's convert. So when y is 0, u is 0. And when y is 1, u is 0. That's great. What does that integrate to? How much area is between, how much area is above one number? None. Right? If you have a curve and you just have one no area, so that equals zero. So that's great. Any question, John? Yeah. Good. Yeah, it makes it beautiful. It makes it simple. Or at least that part. Now we have the geometry, which will freak all of you out. So, we have 9,800 times 7. I claim that this integral represents the area of half a circle. Let's go up and look where that integral came from. So, so that square root right there, let's go back up to where it came from. That square root is, that is it right there. It's the same thing. This is just before we simplified. If we simplified right here, we'd get minus y squared plus, was it 2y? Or just 1y, OK. So that's that right there. So this function represents the right half of a circle. And if you integrate a function, you get the area beneath the curve, but this time we're looking sideways, so we mean to the left of the curve. And if you integrate the upper semicircle, you would get the area of that semicircle. Same idea if you integrate the right semicircle with respect to y, you're going to get the area of that semicircle. Doesn't that just find a quarter of it? Because you have to double it? Uh, the limit, whoops. We're going from 0 to 1, though. 0 to 1. If it was centered at the origin, then we'd have to you know, maybe do a doubling thing. But 0 to 1, so if we integrate that function from 0 up to 1, we're getting the area right there of this, this uh, green region right there. We're getting all that area if we integrate that function from 0 to 1. So if we integrate that function from 0 to 1, we get the area. of a semicircle. 
of radius one half. The area of a semicircle of radius one half is pi times the radius squared. That's the full area, pi r squared, divided by 2. That would give us the area of a semicircle. So we end up with 9,800 times 7 times 1 fourth divided by 2 is 1 eighth. So times pi divided by 8. So pi uh, newtons, so whatever that is. Somebody do 9,800 times 7 divided by 8. Uh, divided by 8, 8,575. 8,575 times pi newtons. What Thank you. Sorry. This integral? Yeah. This yeah. integral represents the area of a semicircle. So for example, let's look at one that's uh, simpler perhaps. Let me just write this. We'll go back to that slide in just a minute. But if we say y equals the positive square root of 4 minus x squared, that is representing what? Well, that is representing the area under this curve. Right? This is a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. This has equation x squared plus y squared equals 4. And if you solve for y, you get the top half. And if you integrate that, you will get the area of the semicircle. So, so it, we didn't recognize that right away by looking at it. You're doomed. <laughs> we, can, like, in, we can integrate and still get the right answer. Yeah. Well, you can't integrate that. That's the problem. Gotcha. Yeah, so you have to recognize that. Because we'll go back and talk about why it's not integrable. So do you does everyone agree with that statement? This one's a little more intuitive. It's a function of x. So there's our element. If we go from 0 to 2, we would double it to get the full area. Just going 0 to 2 will give us this half of the semicircle. So we double it. Okay. That is not integrable because we haven't learned how to do trigonometric substitution yet. So trigonometric substitution is going to allow us to integrate sums and differences of squares that are trapped inside square roots. At this point, we don't have an algebraic way to a calculus way to handle that. So back here, there's no tech. Hmm. There's no technique that you have to integrate that yet. Because you can't split a square root. You can't make that the square root of negative y squared plus the square root. You can't split a square root. That's so it's, uh, punishable by flogging. By flogging. <laughs> yeah, so that one is not integrable right there. Yeah. So we have to use geometry. That's about the hardest integral you know, we would come across at this stage of the game where you come to a place where you can't integrate, and so you have to use geometry. But that geometry is geometry. This is stuff you should have done in Calc 1. If you want to integrate a function, you get the area beneath the curve. This function is the upper semicircle, so you're going to get the area of that semicircle. So since we recognize that the square root was the right side, can we just plug in the semicircle area formula? Yep, uh, which is area divided by 2. Do we have to go? Uh, there will not be one this hard on the exam. I know that everyone is asking that question and not saying it. Do we have to go all that way to get to the point to plug it in, or can we plug it in like from the start? Like well, we couldn't plug it in from the start because at this stage of the game, we had no idea that it was going to boil down to just the area of a semicircle. But right here, we didn't know that. So we were trying to come up with a clever way to integrate this. So we split this apart. And then we got lucky. And this part integrated to 0. And this part was, yeah. So we would not have known that from the beginning. So I know you said to 
hold off on combining the like terms because things cancel out. But if we didn't wait, will we just be screwed? And so you mean like right up here? Yeah. So right here, if you distribute it across, you'd be in a situation where neither one would integrate. Well, like me, I. I was doing the problem already, and I just made it 9,800 times 2, so I had 19,600. Right. And, you, and so then you wouldn't have seen, Anything. yeah, that, that's why I tend to wait, because I didn't know either right away that, oh, we need the 2 there. So it's kind of helpful not to distribute or not to combine everything at once, because we sort of see here that we need the 2 in front of the Y there. So and there will not be one this hard, though, on the exam. This is, this, there's multiple algebraic steps that are, you know, algebra plus. So does the rule of thumb don't combine the terms and delete I don't, yeah. Okay. I mean, I know a lot of people that do, and then they just divide in the end, but I think it's easier just to wait. Okay. Okay, so that's a hard one. Now let's do an easier one. Oh, wait, there's no such thing. No, there is, there is. This one will be a little easier. Circles are harder than lines, but you should be able to do circles. You know it's equations of circles. That's something that you know, so, so let's try this one. So the figure to the bottom, that figure, shows the shape and dimension of a small dam. Assume the water levels to the top, and the dam is the shape of an isosceles triangle. Find the force on the wall. Find the force on the wall. Okay, same idea. We've got this wall. We've got water pressing against it. We draw a horizontal element where there's constant pressure. Pressure's variable. The deeper you go, the heavier the pressure. So that's our setup. Now, we need to know, once again, the ADD part is simple. That's just 9.8, 1,000. And what is, what is the second D? 24 minus, 24 minus Y. So that part's all pretty easy in general. That's how deep the element is, 24 minus Y. So that's the easy part. And then in the area part, there's a DY. That's the e an easy part. The hard part is always this, the width of that element. That is always the hard part, finding the width right there. That's the hard part. But again, it's not, you know algebra really well by now. So if we can find the equation of this line and solve for x, that's half the width. Why wouldn't you use 18? Oh, because, because it's the width varies. Because that width is changing, right? The width is getting narrower as you go deeper, right? So the width is 18 at the top, but the width is getting smaller and it goes all the way down to zero at the bottom. So the, the width is always the variable, unless you happen to have a rectangular wall, which we did one and we'll never do another one. <laughs> so the width is gonna change with your depth based on how deep you are. So let's find the equation of this line. So we're imagining this mathematical line right there and we wanna find the, the equation for that line. Well, it goes through the origin. That means it's y equals mx because b is 0. y equals mx plus b, but it goes to the origin, so it's y equals mx. So we need y equals mx. And the slope, we go up 24 over 9. nine. Number 9. Up 24 over 9. Up 24 over 9 times x. And that can then be, what, 3 goes into both those things? 8 thirds. 8 thirds, thank you. So 8 thirds x. And if we solve for x, we get x is equal to 3 eighths times y. So that gives us half the width. The total width is going to be 2 times 3 eighths y, which is going to be 3 fourths y. Is that clear? x is only measuring from the y-axis to the right. 
So it's only measuring half the width of our horizontal strip, horizontal element. So we have to double it. A lot easier than a circle. Much easier than the circle. So our force then is going to be the integral. What about our limits of integration? Zero to 24. So we have, we have force happening at every horizontal strip between 0 and 24. So we're adding up all those little forces to get the total force. So 0 to 24. Now we just plug in the ADD. That's the easy part. 98, or 9.8, I should say, times 1,000. And the depth, we said, is the total height minus the strip, the strip height. So 24 minus y. So there's our ADD. Now we have to multiply by area. Area is width of the strip times thickness of strip. So w, the w right there, 3 fourths y. And the thickness of that strip is dy. So this is area. And there is our ADD. Acceleration density depth. Acceleration density distance. So that's where I drew the coordinate system, right there. So, so I did it on whatever else it just be a slightly different. Yeah. Like you could draw your coordinate system wherever you wanted. Obviously, it makes the most sense to have your y axis bisecting your wall. And then where you put your x axis is up to you. You could put it at the top, but then you're then your, um, you know, then your y value would be a negative y value because it's sitting down below. So you'd have to be, you know, take that into consideration. Generally, the math is easiest if you put your x-axis right at the base of whatever object you're dealing with. And we'll integrate, and the integral of this. We'll pull out our. 9,800, that part combined. And then we can pull out the 3 fourths also, right? That 3 fourths is just a scalar. So multiplied by 3 fourths. And then the only stuff left inside our integral will be 24 times y minus y times y. That's all that's left. And that's not too hard to integrate. OK, so integrate that. We get 12y squared minus y cubed over 3, 0 to 24. I'll we'll have to break out a calculator for this one. So in the numerator, we have 9,800 times 3 times, let's see, that's going to be 12 times 24 squared minus 24 cubed over 3. And that's all divided by 4. Yeah, let's make this a 3 fourths still. <coughs> so you just have to multiply all that together. This will be units of Newtons. Somebody tell me when you got that multiplied. And I'll write it down. 16,934,400. Thank you. So those are the Newtons you're looking for. 17 million Newtons. Any step there starting to make more sense? Any questions on finding x or w? That tends to be the part that problems occur with. John? So when we do pressure 
uh, times our area, uh, the, we always will get mutants. That's like our unit output from this sort of equation. Right, because pressure times area is force, and units of force are newtons. So as long as we're using meters and kilograms and those things, the standard units will get newtons. Okay. Yeah. So we want to have meters and kilograms. Yes, indeed. Any other questions? Question, Alex? You can ask a question. I'm good. All right. Oh, wait, is that, is that the last slide already? Oh, wow. Well. Oh, yeah, we have to go to 7 3. Let me say a couple things about the uh, test that is coming up shortly. That's next week, right? Next week, week from today. So we'll do a review all day Thursday, so come prepared on Thursday. So here are some things you can do to prepare yourself. If you go to content, there is, I just uh, opened up uh, from last semester, the exam one from last semester is right there. And the key is not open yet. You can start working on that. And then I'll release this key after we meet on Thursday. We can talk about some of the questions on there Thursday. So that'll give you something to practice. And of course, looking at the study guide. Now, the one thing about the study guide is that 7.3 um, is this. In the old book, it was 6.10. In this book, it's 7.3. So the hyperbolic functions are 7.3, 7.3, which is what we're going to do now. Hyperbolic functions. Hyperbolic functions. Those will be the last topic. Last topic, hyperbolics. So we're only doing one chapter from One section. section. Yep, yeah, one section. I, I don't know why they moved 610 to one. So now we cover one section of chapter 7. So the hyperbolics. The hyperbolic trig functions are a parallel universe. <laughs> oh, you're lucky. I was just about to accidentally spill some water. The uh, hyperbolics form a parallel universe to the uh, circular functions. So the circular functions, the six trig functions, those are based on a unit circle. The hyperbolics are based on a unit hyperbola, and they have the same property that the area is, is uh, the, the area divided by 2 gives you, or let me say that again, the area times 2 gives you your hyperbolic angle, the same way that it does with a unit circle. Let's just make sure everyone remembers this weird property with the unit circle. If you talk about the area of the corresponding sector, you will see momentarily. So there's our unit circle. And we know that the area is 1 half theta r squared. And r in this case is 1. On a unit circle, r is 1. If we isolate theta, we see that, oh, theta is twice the area that's in here. So there's the area of our sector, and theta is always two times the area. Fact. Fact. Area is always, this area doubled is always what theta is equal to. Very strange. So what we do in our parallel universe, this is our quote unquote hyperbolic area. And T is called the hyperbolic angle, but we are only using the word angle as a parallel from the circular functions. There's not really an angle T here. This angle in there is not T. We just call it the hyperbolic angle 
because it's inside a hyperbolic function and the hyperbolic functions are paralleling the circular functions. So don't get caught up with trying to figure out where the hyperbolic angle is. There's, there's not a hyperbolic angle in the same way that there's a trig angle. So we take our unit hyperbola and we look at just the right hand side of the unit hyperbola. We ignore the left side. So we're just looking at the right half of x squared minus y squared equals one. So this is where these hyperbolic functions are going to come from. The hyperbolic functions can be defined as exponential functions. Cosh is how I pronounce it. Some people pronounce it, you know, cosinch. Cinch, everybody pronounces pretty much the same. Some people will call the hyperbolic cosine cosinch. I'll call it cosh. Some people call it cosh. Doesn't matter. Quiz your parents, ask them what they call it. Cosh and cinch. Cosh and cinch. So the cosh is the average of exponential growth and decay. Exponential growth, e to the t, is exponential climbing to the right. Exponential decay is e to the minus t, that's descending to the right. The cosh is the average of exponential growth and decay. Cinch is the difference of exponential growth and decay averaged. Cinch? Cinch is the difference of exponential growth and decay averaged. Let's look at the graphs. If you watched week three video, like you should have, you will know what we are about to see. Oh, the graphs are on the next slide. Let me jump to the graphs just. So the graphs, hyperbolic cosine looks like this. Hyperbolic cosine goes through 0, 1, and it is also called the week three video. It's called the famous curve that represents the hanging cable. Starts with the what? C. Starts with the C. First part of the word is like a pet that some of you may have. Catenary. 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 Or as the Brits call it, catenary. A catenary. So the hyperbolic cosine is the hanging cable. It is also referred to as a catenary in the U.S. or a catenary in, in uh, over the water. And. So the hyperbolic cosine models the hanging cable or hanging rope. It is not a para uh, parabola. It is not part of a hyperbola. The catenary is a hyperbolic cosine and none of those other things. It may look parabolic, but there is no parabola that will map the same set of points that the hyperbolic cosine maps. So the hyperbolic cosine is, is the hanging cable curve. Hyperbolic cosine, excuse me, hyperbolic sine, aka cinch, looks a lot like a cubic, but it's not. Looks like a cubic, but it's not. So, and these two, the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine, are going to approach each other asymptotically. They're going to approach each other along this exponential growth asymptote. They both are going to have this exponential growth asymptote. So that's what they look like. Now, you have be just been told that the um, hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine are based on cosine and sine. There's going to be a million properties that are parallel in our parallel hyperbolic universe. If you can write cosh and cinch as exponential functions, in terms of exponential functions, doesn't it seem to reason that you could probably write sine and cosine in terms of exponential functions? If, they're if we have parallel universes, one with a unit circle and one with a unit hyperbola, and the, these guys can be written as 
as, as averages of exponential growth and decay, seems to reason that you could write sine and cosine in terms of, exponential, in terms of exponentials. And the answer is yes, you can. Leads to the most famous formula in math. Who knows the most famous formula in math? E to the pi e to the i plus 1 equals 0. Most famous formula in math, Euler's formula. Euler's formula, all five of our primary constants in one equation. If you're going out and getting a tattoo this weekend, <laughs> that's it. Your, the five most famous constants, the five most important constants, all in one equation. E to the pi i plus 1 is 0. OK, so, but when you write sine and cosine in terms of exponentials, it looks almost identical. The only difference is that there is an i in the exponent where all these x's are. There's an xi, a minus xi, an xi, and a minus xi. We won't do that, though. Because uh, we're not dealing with um, the imaginary, the complex plane, but so Euler's formula will come from writing sine and cosine in terms of exponentials. So these are what most people refer to as the definitions of Sinton Kosh, because when you go back over here to this, you can't really get your cinch and kosh very easily if somebody says, oh, I've got a point on the, the hyperbola, it's right there. It's, it's not as friendly as sine and cosine. With sine and cosine, you can say cosine's the x-coordinate, sine's the y-coordinate. It's pretty easy to use a unit circle. Using a unit hyperbola to find kosh and cinch values is very difficult. So most of us will just think of these as the definitions of cinch and kosh. Um, Okay, tanch, hyperbolic tangent, same pattern that we have for the regular tangent. We do cinch over cosh instead of sine over cosine. Cotanch, that's how most people pronounce that one. Cotan if you call that one tanch, call that one cotanch, which is why some people call this cosinch instead of cosh. Um, so, but most cinch and cosh, tanch, cotanch, sech, and cosech. And they have the same pattern. One over cosine would be secant, one over cosh is sech, one over cinch is cosech, just like one over sine is cosecant. So same patterns. Our focus will be on these three primarily. Those three. And, th and this one a little bit. This one a little bit. All right, so let's go ahead and take our break. And then we'll do some differentiating and integrating of these, of these functions in our parallel universe. Is this what we need to know for everything else? No, it's not. For everything else? When we learn the trigonomic substitution. Oh, not trigonomic. It's the next chapter. Okay. Next up. Yeah, we'll do that in the chapter. When we learn more techniques, more, techniques more techniques of integration. Are we going to learn our ultraviolet voodoo? Ultraviolet voodoo, trig sub. I know what ultraviolet voodoo is. You do? Tell us. What's up? Oh, it's just a different form of substitution. Uh, My calculator taught me because she's like, I don't know how else you do this. So like, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's a way to integrate products. So, to no so it's the reverse product rule. Ultraviolet we do. Reverse product rule. <laughs> so the fundamental identity for hyperbolics. Instead of a Pythagorean theorem, you have this. This is the fundamental identity. It parallels the Pythagorean theorem. So cosh squared minus sin squared is 1. That's our identity. And then let's look at the identities that we can generate from that one. You've got these extra two Pythagorean-ish identities. So, mem I wouldn't memorize, no. no. I mean, these you should be able to construct. Like, how would you get this first one from that one? What do you think you would divide both sides by to get to this second equation? Cos squared, right? 
Divide by cos squared. Cos squared divided by cos squared is 1. Cinch squared divided by cos squared is tanch squared. And then 1 divided by cos squared is such squared. So paralleling what you would do in trig. So in trig, you would divide both sides by cosine squared, divide both sides by sine squared to get your other two. So here, you divide both sides by cos squared to get that one. And what do you divide this one, the for both sides by to get this one? Sin squared. If you divide by sin squared, you're going to get that one. So those are the three Pythagorean-ish identities. The first one is the one you definitely need to know. And then the other two you can get by division. So cos squared minus sin squared, that one, yeah, you have to know that one. But it should be pretty easy. There's our uh, hyperbola. And just like cosine is associated with x and sine is associated with y, same idea, cosh for x, cinch for y. So alphabetical order, C before S. And then these guys, you don't need to know these, but these are properties that you should understand. Anyone know why this is true? Because it's even. So cosine is an even function. Even functions geometrically are, para are symmetric about the y-axis, which means if you go to the right or go to the left, the y values are the same. So that's this, that, this is how you should, in, this, I want you, what you should think of in your head is that if you go to the right or to the left, the y values are the same. Right? The y value at negative x is equal to the y value at x. That's how you should read that. So the y values are the same if you go symmetrically about the y-axis. So if you think about uh, this is x, if that's x, then this is negative x. And hyperbolic cosine looks like the hanging cable. They have the same y values. So we know that even functions, you can erase a leading minus on the inside. And what about cinch? Cinch is an odd function. It's symmetric about the origin. And so with an odd function, minuses jump to the front, just like in tri with trig functions. The minus comes out and becomes a leading minus. And then tanch is also odd because an odd divided by an even is an odd. Odd divided by even is odd. And then we have these, which we're not going to use the sum and difference identities, but you can see that they parallel the sum and difference identities for trig. And just like trig, we have double angle identities. These guys will be given to you if you need them. So I would not, uh, you don't have to memorize these at all. So the main things that we're interested in are derivatives and integrals. So let's go to our derivative and integrals. These are the things that we're going to use. These are, you know, if you go into engineering, this is the stuff that you would need for hyperbolic functions, how to differentiate and integrate. So notice that they are parallel to the derivatives of the trig functions, except the one difference is that the derivative of our three primary functions, so our three primaries are cinch, cosh, and tanch, the derivatives of them are parallel, but they're all positive. So we know that derivative of sine is cosine, but derivative of cosine is minus sine. So that's the one difference. Derivative of cosh is cinch, derivative of cinch is cosh. There's no minus there. But then the next three, the three reciprocal functions here, those guys all have minuses. So. When we were doing derivative of secant, we would get positive secant tangent. But here you get negative. So three primaries, all positive. The three others, all negative. And of course, every derivative formula has a corresponding integral formula. If the derivative of cosh is cinch, that tells us that the integral of cinch is cosh, the integral of cosh is cinch, the integral of such squared is tanch, etc. So <clears throat> every derivative formula leads to an integral formula. In terms of integrals, these two we need to know. And we're going to talk about why they are what they are in a moment. Such and cosach 
don't need to integrate those. Question? So does it matter that it says theorem 7.6 and it says theorem 6.9 on ours? Is that have anything to do with that? That's because, that's because I copied away. it from the old yeah. edition, yeah. Yeah, I meant to update that. I, I think I did. Yeah, I updated them in these notes, but not in those notes yet. Yeah, I forgot to. I'll do that. Okay, so let's try. And before we go here, actually, I want to review one other thing. Uh, because I know that trig is hard. Let's just review some basic integrals. Integral of tangent. How would we do that? Calc 1, you learned how to do that. How would we integrate tangent? What would we, how would we rewrite it so that we could integrate it, no? Write it as sine over cosine. Sine over cosine. That is a perfect first step. And what does that integrate to? Ln. Right, that's in Ln form almost-ish. What's derivative of cosine? What was that? Negative, negative sine. So I'm going to put a negative there, but I have to offset that, so I'll put a negative out in front. Now it's in log form, so we're going to get minus natural <coughs> log absolute value of cosine x, because it's in log form. And if you wanted to, you could bring the minus 1 up as an exponent on the inside and write it this way. Either of these forms is totally acceptable. <laughs> Log form, remember, we went over this last week, so look it back up if you're not 100% clear on it. If you have this scenario, if the derivative of the denominator is in the numerator, this will integrate to natural log of the absolute denominator. So it comes from u substitution. If you were to let u equal f of x, then d would be f prime of x dx. How does the minus turn the cosine into a secant? Brenda, how does it do it? What? How does the minus turn the cosine into a sine? Cos secant. Negative. Um, Inverse, so we better say reciprocal. Reciprocal, so the minus 1 becomes a power, cosine to the minus oh, 1. Oh, because it's a natural one, one over cosine. Yeah. So yeah. log property says that a coefficient can jump up as an exponent, and then if the exponent's negative 1, that's a reciprocal of what's on the inside. And sometimes reciprocal and inverse mean the same thing. Typically, when we're talking about functions, we want to distinguish between reciprocal and inverse, because there is an inverse cosine which is different than the reciprocal of cosine. Reciprocal of cosine is secant, but inverse cosine is a different function. All right, let's try another one. So integral of secant. This one, I'll be so impressed. OK. So one concept is that you know integral of sine and cosine easy. The other four trig functions, so secant and cosecant, tangent and cotangent, they all integrate to logs. All four of them integrate to logs. And we see really easily for tangent, it's not hard. And cotangent's even easier. Cotangent, it's in log form automatically, right? Because that's cosine divided by sine. And that's already in log form. You don't even have to do, you don't, it's not ish, it is. So that's natural log of absolute value of sine plus c. So sine and cosine integrate to logs. Secant and cosecant integrate to logs also. And this is one of those things that you may or may not have seen. The more important thing is that you know that it integrates to a log and you will, we will, see this integrate integration a lot in this class, so it's important for us to sort of understand why. In Calc 1, they probably just showed it to you and didn't go into any detail. But what we need to do is multiply by something 
to put it in log form. So if we know that it's going to be integrating to a log, we know that we should be able to multiply by something so that the derivative of the denominator is the numerator. And here is the trick. This is really kind of tricky. Somebody tell me what the derivative of secant is. Secant tangent. Secant's derivative is secant times tangent. That is sort of the clue as to what we're about to multiply by. So I know that the derivative of secant is secant tangent, but what I'm going to do is modify that a little bit, and I'm going to make it secant plus tangent. So I use that just as a way to remember what I'm going to multiply by. Derivative of secant is secant tan, but I'm going to split it into secant plus tangent. Split it up. And now, in the numerator, we have secant squared plus secant tangent. And in the denominator, we just have sec plus tan. I'm going to reverse the order of that addition, though. Commutative law of addition. We can flip it around, no problem. And I'm just doing that to make the observation that, oh, it's in log form. The derivative of the denominator is the derivative of tan plus the derivative of secant. Derivative of tan is sec squared. Derivative of secant is sec tan. So now it's in log form. It's in log form, so this gives us natural log absolute tan plus secant or secant plus tan. Most of the time, I think you actually see it as secant plus tan. Of course, it doesn't matter. But you will see that integral a ton as we go throughout the semester. Natural log of secant plus tangent or tangent plus secant. So, question. What's so special about E? Nothing. Why couldn't they just chose five then? E is special because it is the only function that has itself as its own derivative. So e to the x, its derivative is e to the x. So that's why it's that's why 2.7 blah blah is more special than five. Why is that important? It's important because when you are looking at the simplest possible differential equation, e is the solution to that. E to the x is the solution to that. Why is that important? So if you think about a population, would you agree that the change in the population is going to be related to the amount in the population? Yes. Do you agree that change is derivative? Right? The rate, of the rate at which something is changing is its derivative. And so E is important because it models almost every form of population growth and decay. And the reason that it models it is because it is its own derivative. And when you're looking at population growth, its rate of change is dependent on itself, which essentially means its rate of change is its own <coughs> derivative. So we'll actually talk about that later. That's, that's why, because E, e solves the, the, the most basic differential equation. But, yeah, that's for another day. OK, let's figure out why the derivative of cotanch is minus cosets squared. So you guys start doing this one. So rewrite cotanch as what it's equal to. It's a quotient of cinch and cosh. So write it down and take the derivative with the quotient rule. And let's see where we go. So derivative of cotanch. So this will parallel what you did in Calc 1, where you found the derivative of cotangent by writing it as its fractional form, and then using the quotient rule. Start in the bottom. Lodi high? Lodi high? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you were in Jonathan's class? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because, yes, absolutely. Quotient rule is super important. Low to the high minus high to the low. Low squared. Or low, low. Oh, okay. Low, low. Lodi high minus high to the low over low. Over low? You don't know the quotient rule? <laughs> Co quotient rule. Mm. 
uh, is it minus? minus? Yes. Okay. I mean. Anyone remembers it without the acronym? When he was doing it, I was like, what the hell are you saying? <laughs> now I cannot say it. I know. Now it's like one of those songs you can't get out of your head. Lodi High. <clears throat> oh, that's F prime. F prime. Lodi High minus I D low or low squared. Somebody raise their hand when you've got it. Anyone there yet? Close. 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 So we everyone know that we're gonna re we're rewriting it as what are we writing? What is the fractional form of it? What goes in the numerator? Kosh. Kosh. Kosh over sinh. So then when we take the derivative of cotanch, that's the same as taking the derivative of the kosh over sinh. So then we do our quotient rule. Low d high, that means start in the bottom. The low function is down here. Multiply by the derivative of the high function. So low d high. The derivative of the numerator is cinch. They are each other's derivative. Super cool. So, low d high minus high d low. They are each other's derivatives over low low, over low squared. And that gives us cinch squared minus cosh squared in the numerator. And what is cinch squared minus cosh squared? One. Close. Negative, Negative one. Cosh squared minus cinch squared is one. So if you reverse them, you get negative one. So that's going to be negative one over sin squared. And that is equal to minus coset squared. <clears throat> Any step there you're not sure about? All right, go for number 20. So you can do that one. So practice with your free stuff. Your quotient rule. <clears throat> Say that again. Uh, are we looking here? Right here? Going to there. So 1 over cinch is cosetch. Yeah. So we have, you could think of this as minus 1 over cinch times cinch. Yes. Which is minus 1 out in front times 1 over cinch times 1 over cinch. Mm -hmm. right, Make sense? Yeah. So then cosetch, cosetch, cosetch squared.
Oh, oh. So quotient rule again. So set can be written as one over cosh, and then apply the quotient rule for that. And what is d high when you have a, a one in the numerator? How did you do your push rule? Oh, you just have like, that's super G of X. Oh, I'm worried. Yeah. So, um, so then you do, um, if you did F over G, so then it's G times F prime minus yeah. F times G prime over G squared. So, you, yeah, you could do it that way. Yeah, low D high minus high D low for the squared. <laughs> Makes it a lot easier. Yeah, so your low D high is zero minus. High is one, D low is cinch, cos squared is yeah. yeah. and, and then that you're going to split your cos squared into cos cos, and then cinch over cos is cinch, and then cos is cinch. Yep, yep, yep. Trina, right, yours going? I wish they had things like that for everything we do. Any issues? Maybe, maybe something. Let's see. So you're... Yeah. 40 minutes. Uh, 36 minutes. Where are we at? Is it, oh, right there. Oh, now that's not sufficient. Gosh. That's, oh, that's, yeah, so yeah, that, yeah, that's, so that should just be one over yeah. gosh. Well, that's true. So then apply the quotient over one over gosh. So one over gosh. <laughs> The derivative of cosh is cinch, the derivative of the numerator is zero, so that part is zero. Yeah. Right? Because the numerator has a one. So the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, the derivative is one is zero. That part will zero out. Minus the derivative of that. You see how it goes in there? Split it one over gosh. Well, yeah, it's just one over five. Yeah. 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 The last is question. I don't know. Question roll? So when you're looking here, you're that's, that's your um, quotient. I really need that. Yeah. Minus that. A lot. A derivative of that. And then divided by low squared. Yeah, like squared. Squared, yeah. All right, let's go through this. Yeah. Yeah, call, call hyperbolic cotangent cotange. Calling it cotch just sounds gross. Cotch. <laughs> cotch. <laughs> 
Cotange. Just, just, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just <laughs> I might just mark you off to annoy you. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're thinking about the numerator we're calling high and the denominator we're calling low. So high and low. And so the quotient rule says start in the bottom, low d high. So low times derivative of the numerator. So there's low. Derivative numerator is 0 minus high, which is just 1. d low is the derivative of low, which is cinch, divided by low low. So that's cosh squared. <coughs> and then cosh times 0 is 0. So we have minus cinch in the numerator, and then cosh squared. And what we're going to do is thinking about, we're going to think about cosh squared as cosh times cosh. And you can think about cinch as cinch times 1, and then you can just pair them off. So that one's going to be a tanch, and that one's going to be a setch. So minus um, tanch. Such oh, no. or you can reverse the order, such tanch. Like in trig, we usually call it seek tan, such tanch, such tanch, such tanch. Write a song. That would be a really good way to remember all these. Yeah. Yeah, low words. Yeah. Derivative integral song with these guys. Okay, derivative. Uh, let's go ahead and do a derivative using the power rule. So we're going to rewrite this as cotanch of 3x to the 1 half. Power rule. I'll let you try it for a moment first. At least get the first <laughs> step down. Power rule. Power rule followed by chain rule. Which part don't you like? Switching from derivatives and using derivatives. It's convoluted. Yeah, some people say that. Also, sine h instead of sine. Yeah, I'm gonna say. Sine h. Sine h. Cosine h. Not that. <laughs> um, it's too late. It's, it's too late. Ingrained. It's ingrained. Yeah. Where did the H come from? Like, why is it H? Anyway? For hyperbolic. Yeah. They should have put it in front. 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 Put it's math. No, it's not English. Well, English has all sorts of things. I don't know, but English is easier to comprehend than English. That's because you've been using it since you were zero-ish. Zero-ish. No, out of the game. I was speaking Shakespeare. How'd you know? Power rule. What you get? Yep, half down. So half down. So, so we, uh, for cotanch, we don't take derivative yet. We bring down the half. We leave the base there. We subtract one. So the power rule part, we don't take any derivative yet. The power rule part is just bring the power down, subtract one, we leave the base one. And now you multiply by the derivative of cotanch. What's the derivative of cotangent? Yeah, minus. So it's going to be minus cosep squared. Minus cosep squared. Minus cosep squared. What the breaks? 
your money as it is in the other I'm really bad at pronouncing things, so I need to. We got, okay, we got a cosh, we got cinch, we got tinch, we got cough, we got sech, and we got cinch. I have my own crazy pronunciations of things. Cosh, cinch, tinch. Cough, sech, kisch, 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 There's no real thing. It's fun to say, honestly. Kisch. Okay, switch. No, 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 the, the fancy S. Kisch. Yeah. Sign it. Yeah. It's not like much, man. It's it's I see it's three it's three it's three syllables. It's they're just the same. Yeah. Alright, let's go ahead and do this one. So the first step in taking the derivative is the power rule part. Power down, subtract one. So power in front, leave the base alone, subtract one. So that's the power rule part. Power rule part, we just leave the base alone. We don't do anything with the base. Now the chain rule piece says now differentiate by the derivative of the base. The derivative of the base, cotange is like cotangent. Cotangent's derivative is minus cosecant squared. This is going to be minus cosec squared. So minus cosec uh, squared, cosec squared of 3x times 3. So that will be our chain rule part. The derivative of the base is the minus cosec squared of 3x times 3. And then simplifying, there's not a lot we can do. We're going to get minus 3 cosec squared of 3x divided by 2 times the square root of cotanch 3x. OK, so now if we wanted to, we know that there is a hidden cinch in the cosec, or um, yeah. And we know that there's also one of those in this, co in this cotange. So we could go a little bit further. If we switch everything back to cinches and coshes, we could actually do a little bit more simplifying. So let's do it just for practice. So we're going to write this as, I'm going to put the minus 3 halves out in front for now just to keep it separate from the hyperbolic trigs. So cosec, that's 1 over cinch squared. of 3x. This one is the square root, and we can treat that as a half power. So cotanch is cosh over cinch. But we're dividing by it, so I'm going to switch it to cinch over cosh. So it's going to be cinch to the half of 3x over cosh to the half of 3x. Is 
Does everyone follow that? So a square root is a half power. Cotanch is cosh over cinch, but we're dividing by it, so we multiply by the reciprocal, so it becomes a cinch over cosh. And now we can, and now this is, on a test, I would be completely fine with this right there. But this is practicing some of these substitutions just to get some practice. OK, so then in the numerator over here, we're going to have a 1. And how many cinches are we going to have if we have a half upstairs and a 2 downstairs? One. one. Did I hear 1 and a half? So 3 halves, 3x, three and then cosh. Just as some practice, moving these symbols around. It doesn't look simple to me. I know. It's all a matter of opinion. So a couple things you want to be aware of. Your exponent should be over just on top of the H. It's very tempting to move it on top of perhaps the SIN because you're familiar with the trig functions. And so make sure that the power, especially if it's, a, well, it doesn't matter if it's a fraction or an integer, make sure it's on the H. And don't put it on the x on the inside, because if you put it on the x, that means just the angle is squared or raised to the power. All right, let's do the next one. So we'll just go through this one together. I think. So this is a quotient rule if we leave it as it is. Now, we could actually rewrite y and get rid of the cosetch. Really and then it's going to be much easier. We could use a product rule. So we could write it this way. Cosetch is 1 over cinch. Cosetch is 1 over cinch. We're dividing by it, so that means multiply. So we get an x cinch. So that would be a little easier to do a product rule with x times cinch than x divided by cosetch. So then we do first times derivative second plus derivative first times second. Is that the way you all have normally done product rule? So the important, the, the point I'm trying to make there is that if we have y equals f times g, y prime is f g prime plus f prime g. Is that the direction most of you do it? If so, that's good. Some people will do it first derivative second plus second derivative first, and write this as g f prime, which of course is fine because of the commutative law of multiplication. But it's very good to get into this habit because in calculus three, you are going to be dealing with a different type of product with vectors. And with vectors, there's no commutative law of multiplication. So the commutative, multi commutative law of multiplication is not going to hold. And the, you will do the derivative for, for a product in the same way, but you have to do it this way. You can't write it as gf prime because there's, there's no commutative law for that type of multiplication. So that's a good habit to be in. First derivative second plus derivative first second. Good habit. So that is our derivative. Um, let me write y prime on the left here, though. All right, let's try one of these composite functions. So f prime. Derivative of a log is 1 divided by the inside. That's the primary method for differentiating a log. 1 over the inside. times the chain rule part is going to be times the derivative of the inside. So 1 over the inside times derivative of sech. So we know it's going to be a sech tanch thing, just like the derivative of secant is a secant tan. 
but is it positive or negative? Negative. It's going to be negative. So our primary three, cinch, cosh, tanch, all differentiate positively. The other three all differentiate with a negative. So it's going to be minus such of 2x tanch of 2x times 2. And that should be a parenthesis so it doesn't look like subtraction. <coughs> and then we have a little cancellation. So we're going to get minus 2 tanch 2x. So this book um, likes to put, well, all, all math books do like to put the power right there. But sometimes when you're differentiating, it might help to put it on the outside. It's completely up to you. If you don't get confused by that at all, don't do this. But some folks get confused by that when they're trying to differentiate, and it's a little easier to put it up there. When it's down here, the mistake is often to forget to differentiate the base. So the base of that exponential expression is cosh 3x. And when the 2 is just floating over here on the h, sometimes it's easy to forget to differentiate the base. So if, you, if that's not a problem for you, don't worry about it. If it's something you tend to have an issue with, then write it like that. It might be easier to remember to differentiate the base. So f prime x. <coughs> The primary thing that's happening over here is multiplication. We have two functions being multiplied together. We have the x squared multiplied by the cosh squared. So when we're differentiating a product, we use the product, the product rule. So first times derivative second. So there is first. The derivative of the second, we need to use a power rule in com conjunction with a chain rule. So the power rule part is 2 cosh 3x to the 1. Bring down the power, subtract 1, leave the base alone. Multiplied by the derivative of the base. And what's the derivative of the base? Mm -hmm. So cinch 3x times 3. So that's going to be first derivative second. So first derivative second plus derivative of first, that's just 2x, times the second. And I didn't put parentheses around it earlier. I didn't put it out. OK, so. That's it. We just have to clean it up a little bit. So it looks like we're going to have 6x squared and then cosh times cinch. Plus 2x cosh squared. So that's fine for a derivative. There's not much we could do there. No need to factor a common factor out. That doesn't not going to help us. The only time you would write your final answer in factored form is if for some reason you wanted the zeros of the derivative. So if you're trying to find critical points, then it would make sense to factor and put it in a multiplicative form. But for us, we're not doing that, so we don't need it. Everyone OK with the derivative of cosh squared? All right, integrals. So we will get to very complicated trig integrals later. At this stage, we're dealing with simple, in air quotes, integrals that have trig functions. In other words, it should just be no harder than a simple u substitution. Should be. So that's what we want to identify. We want to think, OK, is there a u that would work for u sub here? 
There's only one number. <laughs> this is real math. Only one number and like eight letters or more than eight letters. Thirty-eight. Oh yeah, there's thirty. It's problem thirty. Would our use substitution be such? Maybe. Because that would because the derivative of that is such. Minus such set minus so if we did let u be set, let's see what happens. So if u is set, then du is minus such tanch. So does that work? Yep. Oh, that works pretty well. People are negative. Because here we're going to think of this as if we wanted to, we could peel this set apart. Right, such squared, we could write as such such. And if we let u be such, that's right here. And then isn't all of that du? So that would work for sure. Pull out the negative. Pull out the negative. So let's rewrite this as integral of u du divided by minus 1. We'll put the minus 1 out in front. And maybe I'll write this as minus du here just to emphasize that it's not exactly du, but it's pretty darn close. So then we get minus u squared over 2 plus c. And then we go back to our original variable. So we'll write it as minus 1 half such squared of x plus c. Is there another way we could have done it? Is there another u that would work? What's the derivative of tanch? Such. What's that? Such squared. Such squared. Oh. Let's try that. Let's just notice that uh, we could go, so, or let's let u equal tanch, which means du will be such squared of x times dx. So if we go that way, we're going to get the integral of u. So we're plugging in u for tanch. And then set squared dx, that is du. So this is it. So we get u squared over 2 plus c, which is we back substitute. We get 1 half set squared x plus c. Wait a second. Yeah, wait a second. X. Something seems wrong, doesn't it? If you put in u, wouldn't it be tan squared? Um, right in this one? Yeah. Let's see. So we plugged in u is tan. Uh, the and then du, derivative of tan, is set squared. It's positive. So when you plug in u at the end, Oh, oh, that's what that's what it is. Thank you. I was like, wait, something. Obviously, something's weird. Yeah, yeah this is tanch. Thank you. That is tanch. Something was wrong. There we go. Because it's one half u squared, but u is tanch here, not such. U is tanch. So those two are equal. They don't look equal. But how would we show that they're equal? Use an identity. So we could use an identity and replace tan squared and get that one, or vice versa. So they are, in fact, equal. But you would take either mm -hmm. answer? Like Definitely. Like exam? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. This one is in what form? Log form. Log form. We're done. This is natural log, absolute value of 1 plus cosh x plus c. Something hot. Everyone agree? Is the derivative of the denominator the numerator? Yeah. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of cosh is cinch. So yeah, it's natural log form. It's in log form. Now, do we need the absolute value bars in this case? Because it's an even function. 
function. It's not just that it's an even function, it's that it's a function that's never negative. negative. Right, the hanging cable sits above the x-axis, so it's never negative. So cosh, which is the hanging cable, this is always greater than or equal to 1. So that means we don't really need the absolute value bars because <coughs> what's inside is already positive. So we don't need them. <coughs> Log form. <coughs> All right. Some more letters. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay. So let's try u equals, what do you want to let u equal? Cotange? Is that what you said? Yeah, okay, cotange. Let's try it. We don't want to do cotange squared or cosec squared because then you get the two coming down, the derivative of the base. You're going to get something that's much more complicated. So it should hopefully be as simple as just choosing the base of one of those. So if we let u be cotange, the derivative is minus cosec squared of x dx. So let's see, does that get us everything we need? So we're going to have the integral cotant squared, that'll be u squared. Cosec squared x dx, that's going to be minus du. We'll get that. And that will be minus u cubed over 3 plus c, which will be equal to minus 1 third cotant cubed of x plus c. So some of these integrands can look really confusing. You may just feel overwhelmed, but just start somewhere. Try cotant. Try cosec. Just see. Just try one. Because all the integrals up to this point in the class are going to be u substitution at the worst. So, so just try. All right. Sin squared. Use an identity. Use an identity. Let's go. Use an identity. So um, where are we? We're on that slide. OK. So when we go back to the identities, we have, we have identities that are called power reduction identities. And those power reduction identities I do. Um, are used for integrating. So in Calc 1, you should have integrated sine squared and cosine squared. And the only way to integrate sine squared and cosine squared is to power reduce them. The same is true for cinch squared and cos squared. The way you integrate is to reduce the power with these two identities. So this identity reduces the power right there. So we're going to get cosh of 2x minus 1 over 2. Let's see, where are we? So cosh. Minus one a part of the cosh. It's not on the inside, so that is outside of the hyperbolic function. And so what we'll do is rewrite this as one half on the outside, and then cosh two x minus one on the inside. Does anyone know off the top of their head what the identity is for the trig function sine squared of x? It's going to be very similar, it's just that the minus is reversed. So it looks like that. So that's how you would reduce sine squared. So it's the same identity except the numerator is reversed. And now we can do a, a pretty straightforward integration here. We're going to get 1 half multiplied by integral of, of cautious cinch of the same angle. But then we have to do reverse chain rule and divide by 2. 2 minus 
x plus c. So we would write this as 1 fourth cinch 2x minus 1 half x plus c. A square? Yeah. Where? Since we brought it down, put it over two. Uh, right here? No, the, the second last step. One went down right there, and then we put it over two. Where is that name? This is a two. That's a two. So, so should we just square it? Up here? Yeah, no. Because the integral of cos, so cos is raised to the first power, and its integral is cinch to the first power. And then this 2 combines with this 2 in the denominator, so it's not a power. Oh, it comes from the chain. It comes from the chain, yes. Reverse chain rule, we're integrating that. The reverse chain rule. All right, we've got one more slide. We have 30 seconds. What do you think we should let u be here? Square root of x, great choice. So then du is going to be 1 half. 1 half x to the minus 1 half, which looks like that. And we're going to multiply both sides by 2. And I'll just write the setup here. So this will be the integral of such squared of u. dx over root x is 2 times du. So we'll put a 2 du. And then we can finish this later. We'll put some pie cookies there. Zero to four, but we the zero to four are of u x's. Right. We yeah. switch to u, so we either convert to u limits or put some pie cookies there until later. Somebody loves. Pie we love pie cookies. Somebody last semester at the end of the semester brought in a big tray of pie cookies. I can't so good. I make. I, I know how to make. Them. You make cookies. I make cookies. I make cookies. Put got it. Stamp them with a pie. <laughs> So All right, let's like take a break. So Thursday we'll do review, take a look at that test from last semester, start working on it. We'll go over any questions that you have. And this time I will hit.